recorded? Yes, I was recorded. What? Sorry? You begin with it. What do you want? Okay, so because I will start in one minute. So. Oh, okay. I recorded. I recorded. Okay. Record. Record. Thank you. And do I have to talk to this? Or ah, please. please tell really? Me. I hate it. Really. Like to, uh, talking to that and typing. It doesn't go. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, I will slowly start. So nice to see you here at DevOx Morocco. It's my first time in Casablanca. In fact, in Africa, what I saw the very first time. Interesting. So, okay. Uh, about me, just very shortly, I am a, a developer, wizard, and an architect. Just, there is no time to explain what does it mean, especially an architect has a special role, I think it's needed. I live in Lausanne, Switzerland, so it's like, you know, this beautiful country in the middle of Europe, or over the lake, under the mountain, work for this company, mostly doing consulting stuff for banks and insurances. That's more my Pokemons I love, that I love or hate, depends. Uh, okay, my email and my tweet, so anytime, please follow me, you want to ask a question, whatever. I'm there. Uh, so what I am going to present to you today is uh, something called Ratpack, but it's just a small tool uh, that represents a, let's say, bigger set of tools. So lot, there are a lot of tools that work in the way that Ratpack, but it's not very common to use that type of servers in Java. So that's, I think, a good example of something that is wider. So it's not only about Ratpack, uh, but it's about something called non-blocking servers. So who is there any one of you that worked with non-blocking servers in Java? Okay, one. And okay, so, so you, you've seen Ratpack before? That's right. No. Okay, great. So I will show you. So we'll, we'll be showing some small real demos here. I will present you, and I will present you the whole like architecture. It's so it'll be like it won't be real life coding I'll be doing today because I don't have much time. But I'll try you to show you how to do small application from top to bottom. I will present you where are the examples, basically. basically. Uh, and then summary and uh, even alternatives. And the most important question for me is also uh, always why? So the, the thing I am going to tell you today is why it's even interesting with, uh, to use something like Ratpack. Okay, so uh, by the way, that's a, there is a great page on the web classic programmers paintings and it's this one is representing the how Scala developer feels like when it's uh, you know uh, confronted with a typical Java software for banks using Maven Spring and Hibernate it's like this poor guy there so I, I was like <laughs> Java EE Spring and Hibernate guy for many years I uh, like 15 years I am using more, more or less Java EE I even used EJBoss 1.0, so it's even before it was called JBoss. Uh, and I loved that, that stuff till the moment I tried something different, really. Uh, in, in the moment I tried to do something with Scala, I started to hate all the things from Java E, etc. Et but I will show you why later. And I was like this poor guy. Okay, so right now I'm going to present you the second most useless Fibonacci implementation you ever see. So it's maybe, it's also very interesting to, to remember that because yeah, it might be funny for you later to use it some, somewhere, okay. Uh, so, so what is a rat pack? So first of all, rat pack is a library and if you are going to use rat pack, you have simply to, to put a dependency on in Gradle or Maven, it's just one dependency, nothing more. No XMRs, no configurations, nothing like that. One dependency, you have it. And the second best thing about Ratpack, you know, the very every good story starts with public static void main. And it's like, it's in, for me, it's like writing something with Ratpack is like very refreshing. I am building a server in Java, and I don't publish it to any application server, don't build years, wars, whatever. I'm just starting with public static void main. So, and it's okay. So that's cool stuff. So what I'm doing here, I'm creating the instance of this class, my server, and here in this method start the real meet start. So, you see, ratpack server start. Then I put something like config. I will explain it to you later. Config is not really that, that's optional part. But the most interesting part is here. So what is a HTTP? It's like your REST server. You put a server that 
listens to some port like 8080 and on some paths like FIB with some number behind it, it will do something like call this method. So let's see this method. This FIB is this method. It takes some context. From context, you can read stuff like what kind of n was uh, added as a parameter, and then I can render, re render responses. So for, at the beginning, I will make very bad implementation of Fibonacci. So whenever this n is from context is below 2, I will render answer 1. Otherwise, I will put those question marks, because I'm going to uh, like uh, build the whole version. OK? so. I have it, so I've just started. You see, great stuff about Ratpack starts in a second. So basically, you do it in a loop, Ratpack server. How long do you think the server in Java can start? Who is for Just bet. How long? It starts if I'm doing it in a loop. Like, I'm starting 1,000 times. How, the last couple of servers, how long do I start? How long does it take? Bet. Give me a number. I, I tell you, it's fast. <laughs> 15 seconds. Seconds? 15 seconds. Now it's below 15 seconds. It's smaller. Okay, no? 15 milliseconds. 15 milliseconds, it's exactly this. It's That's between 10 or 15 milliseconds. So it means in one second I can start this server like almost 100 times. Okay, 50 for sure. It means, for instance, if I am testing, I can do black box testing, like starting it so many times and do full black box testing. Okay, nevertheless, so we have, we have whole JVM, it starts like two seconds, but yeah, it's mostly JVM starting of the rat pack. Okay, so I just started it, so let me test it. Like, so localhost 8080, I hope it's this port I call FIB, and then maybe one. Yeah, it's one, okay? So, because the number I've given was, if, if it's zero, it's still one, but if I put like three, it's, gives me question mark because it's not yet implemented. So, okay, I'm going to, I don't have that much time, so I will skip the real writing implementation. We'll see how it's, uh, I, will, I will revert to the full version and we'll see. So, why this version of uh, Fibonacci is useless? Because I was going to um, uh, do it very funny way, like this server, whenever somebody S for Fibonacci of 7, it will take to do, you know, recursive version of Fibonacci. Fibonacci of 7 is like at uh, what? Fibonacci, uh, at the Fibonacci of uh, n minus 1 plus n minus 2. So it's like Fibonacci of 6 plus Fibonacci of 5. Okay? So, but I did it. Normally you would write a function, but I do it more fun way. I call the same server. So I do, but every time I'm asked about Fibonacci on HTTP, I call myself with HTTP and with a n minus 1 and n minus 2. What's interesting here, I'm calling, but you see here is URL, but I don't get a long number. It's promise of long. Who knows what is promise? What is the promise? A deferred response. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Not exactly. It's deferred. So, for, for those of you that know, promise is a container, like a list of container, optional, you know, optional. So, promise is kind of like optional, but it's optional in the future. So, something that will happen. The most important part of it, so, like, if I have a future response of this, it means whenever the server, this method goes, like I'm uh, asked for Fibonacci of 7, it means I'm calling Fibonacci of 6. And I go farther. I don't stop. I'm just given a promise. So this algorithm will get uh, in the future the response for Fibonacci uh, my n minus one, then Fibonacci n minus two. And the most important part about promises: you never, you should never ever wait for promises. Like let's wait till it's done. Let's wait till it's done. No, we do it differently. So that's the most interesting part of that. Whenever I'm writing that program, I promise from of long. My result is, if I am given this result, then I combine it with this result in the future. And that's a recursive version. And one, and one to the first result to the second result. And I'm given the promise. At the, at the end, I'm still having a promise. And what, the, what I return to the, to the rat pack is I'm not returning that value, the lamp. I'm returning the promise. 
It means that the server knows, OK, it, it goes. But it, in fact, the thread, nothing stops here. It on, only operates on promises. Finally, somewhere in the, in the future, this thing will return, this thing will return on both things will return, this will be called, calculated, and the uh, client will get the response. That's the whole idea of how the run pack and not block the big work. So we should never ever wait here for the responses. That's the most, most interesting part, most important part. Like calling this Fibonacci one get and stopping it. To get it, it would be a bad idea. Okay, but why it's that? Uh, let me show you why it's great, first of all. So I will like start the server. Uh, just a moment, so I'm starting the server. Uh, now, okay, I will exit the presentation mode. Uh, view. Uh, it's slow, exit presentation mode. And right now, whenever I call Fibonacci of three, I should get an L result. Let, let's see how fast is that, okay? So, I'm doing very, very simple, uh, very, very simple benchmarking with Apache benchmark. It's very bad benchmarking, but it's for this simple thing is enough. I'm calling Fibonacci of 10. Fibonacci of 10 doesn't normally, it's, it's nothing fancy, but if you think about this implementation, how bad is that? That for every request, it creates two other requests, and then two others, but it explodes the request. It is very, very bad implementation, so it's really, <laughs> it's very involving in terms of I.O. So see how slow it would work, okay? Like I have 100 requests, 200 requests. We'll wait till 1,000 of requests are oh, done, okay? Da -da -dum -da -dum -dum -dum. Slowly, slowly there. And by the way, I'm concurrently doing five of them. So constantly I'm having like, uh, and the most important part is like, I'm more or less having like 60 requests per second, okay? So even though it's so bad implementation of Fibonacci, still I'm getting 60. Requests per second. If I read it correctly, correctly without this recursive calls, it would be like a thousand. But okay, it's okay. Let's look at this result. Let's see the algorithm. Okay, who knows Spring or Java or whatever, whatever you know? Okay, in basically, <coughs> normally in Spring you can do the same thing. So you can also type out from the Fibonacci recursive. So it's bad implementation. So let's compare the bad implementation with Spring. Okay, so you probably seen this with annotations. I'm even using uh, Spring Boot. Who has used Spring Boot before? So again, it's cool. I'm starting in public, starting for it main. It's a great story. So uh, small difference is I'm request making uh, with uh, parameter n, and I do more or less the same. Fibonacci. It's completion stage is almost the same as promise. Okay, but I'm doing one bad thing. Calling get means I'm blocking. So I'm blocking this thread because that's the standard way how you do it with Spring. You block because you have one request per thread, you block till both the answers come and then you put the answer uh, as the result. So that's a small difference, but let's see how it works. So if I call right now Spring version of this, it's a little bit different because I'm calling with uh, n is like 1. N is like 5. N is like 10. Let, let me call with that. It works. So let, let me do a benchmarking with Spring here. It's like uh, this. And N is 10. So the same, but with Spring. And we'll wait for the result. We'll wait. We'll wait. Uh, oh, we're all probably going to wait too long. We will never see the result. And you, who knows why? <laughs> who knows? But so I, I can only tell you if the end was yeah. smaller, we would see something probably. Uh, I, I'm trying. I will try to do that. Okay. So I've shown you some small disaster that happened in a classical blocking server that all of you use. By the way, the same kind of disaster happened to me on the production system because of the same reason. I'm going to describe you later <coughs> why. So. I will be more like, how to call it, more, more pleasant to my server. I will call it with Fibonacci 8. I should see something. Or the oh. Right now, if I, if I started with smaller n for spring, it worked. It's still not very fast, but it worked. 
So you see that the rough conversion was for a bigger number was very uh, was uh, almost as fast as a dispersion uh, for much more smaller number in terms of Fibonacci. It's uh, like this implementation is it is going like uh, four times less processing. And if I'm calling with uh, n uh, equals to ten, it just never stops. It, it never works. So there is some kind of problem with Spring here in this approach. And I'm going to explain you what very quickly. So let's go back to this. So we've seen some kind of demo. So this is the standard way we do servers in Java. One request, one thread. And basically, if I'm dying, doing like 100 concurrent requests, it means I have 100 threads. No other problem in Java, okay? But there is a small problem. We always have some kind of limit. We can put it very high, but we always have a limit. So how many threads concurrently are working, okay? So typical limit for like for Tomcat, whatever you see, is like 200 threads. And then what happens if, if I'm with the, because with this Fibonacci, every call to Fibonacci is doing two other calls to the smallest Fibonacci. So it means like I'm doing uh, at the end like hundreds of concurrent calls from even from calling one Fibonacci of 10. So I'm very quickly going to this limit and what then happens? All that is above limit goes to some kind of queue. It's waiting till one of these threads is free. But if I'm doing these recursive calls, like here is Fibonacci of 10, and it's calling Fibonacci of 9 and Fibonacci of 8 in this queue, this will never be free till this is resolved. So we get, and in one moment, Spring version is just deadlocked. And by the way, if you have microservices, you might have some kind of this deadlocks even that is involving even more services and servers at the moment. As long as you're doing this one request, one thread approach with Java, which is like standard right now with Spring or Java. So what we have seen, one, non-blocking servers already have one advantage. They don't deadlock that easily. And we will see one more thing, OK? So I will, oh, moment. I will present you one more interesting file. How many threads are used in Ratpack implementation? So we'll go back to the Ratpack version. And I'm going to show, <coughs> here I had something like configuration, this config. In this method config, I'm configuring how many threads are involved. And you see, I was able to process hundreds of concurrent requests in one thread. Interesting. So uh, maybe you remember I was doing how many. So I can do it like, but it doesn't mean I have to use one thread. I could, because it's possible. But I can use like four threads. Then it should be a little bit faster. So let me check it. So if I call, call the same with more threads. Oh, come on. I'm starting. And it should be a little bit faster. It depends. But it's even more funny. OK, we will wait. Sometimes it's faster, sometimes not. Uh, I will tell you why. So, okay, I get got the same request per second, not 60. It's so it's quite quite irrelevant number. So, but I can also call this wrap up with 300 threads, and we'll see something. Right now, I'm more or less know what to do. By the way, this is very unprofessional benchmark. It's only you should you should really see if I, you know, some pointing towards something, but don't don't take it too seriously. Like uh, doing a personal <coughs> benchmark is very tough. But more or less it will show something. I hope, hopefully, if I'm happy. Professional benchmark it means I really should stop all, all the things on the machine and should make it very impolite uh, environment which I'm not doing. So if I did with 300 threads, nevertheless, I get far worse performance. Who knows why? Why do you request per tweet? Uh, now there is a, okay, I will explain you, okay? So what we've seen is like, oh my god, maybe if you if you had it, seen it before, you, you use Java, you typically with uh, servers in Java, the more threads you use, the bigger performance you have. But right now I've shown something different. So why is that? So uh, before I even go to answer this question, I'll show you once again what does it mean non blocking. So let's see, imagine I have service, like HTTP service that in order to perform that, I have first to ask another HTTP server, and then I maybe have to call the database. So I'd like to, I'm doing two things, okay? So, and after I call the server, maybe I get some information that I should ask from the database. So let's imagine, okay, it's very badly 
feasible here. Uh, let's get started. Then, then comes a request, request number one. And then comes a request number two. But what I do in a non-blocking server is I only do I force the call. So what's there? And I call this HTTP server, but then I don't wait for the response. I just say, give me that when you when I when you are ready, just send me you send me your answer. Okay? So then comes the second request. Imagine this is one thread. So then comes the second request. And on one thread I serve in the second customer, second client, sorry. And second client also calls, I call HTTP server, but I don't wait for its response. I only say, call me when I have this response. And then while processing this second request, maybe response for first came. So I can call the database, but instead of just waiting for the database, only call the database and tell the database, I call you when you have my results, call me. But I don't wait. So maybe while doing that, for asking database, I got a response from the, my second call, and then you get the, the, get the idea. I never wait. I only tell all my resources that I order you to do that. When you have results, call me back. So maybe while processing request, uh, third request here, so third, third client, I got answered for the request two and request two from database. In a, even in a different order, and finally I'm able to send something to the to the all those clients. It's, and basically, it all works on one thread. What it means, uh, if we look at it differently, it means that like I'm a worker, I have a task queue, and it's like I'm taking something from the top of my pile of, of tasks that has to be done. I see what's there, and I process that. But where, whenever I'm going to ask a database, a file, whatever. Someone else, I only call this, maybe that's like, imagine that's another guy in the company. I call him by a phone. Hi, Joe, can you give me the results from database? But I don't like wait on the phone, on the line. I only say to him, when you are ready, just call me back. And then I put the phone and I start processing the different part. part. And then Joe is doing his stuff. When Joe is finished, he just sends me results just somewhere here. So what? A couple of minutes later, I got the phone. I asked, okay, Joe, you have the results, okay, I can process uh, further. So it means like I'm always processing small tasks and never wait on the line. It's very interesting, important because. Have you seen this picture before? Okay, this is uh, about latencies, but what is very important with if you have modern processor, you have caches. So it means if you switch on one core between different threads, between different parts, it means you are typically flushing the caches and you have to refresh all of this. It means huge waste of, uh, of bandwidth to run. It typically means that if you have everything in cache, then it's like 100 times faster than compared to have to get the data from memory. It's like whenever you, like you're switching between tasks. You know, when you work for two projects, is it efficient? So it's the same for Java servers. It's efficient to work till the end of one process, on one task, and when you have finished, you, you stop it. So what happens if you have like 300 threads? Okay, what happens? You have 300 threads, scheduler constantly switching them. So sometimes you have all the data, you process like, I have HTML for my request. It's almost all ready. And then if I would send it to the requesting client, but in this moment, scheduler says, okay, you thread, your time is gone. I'm going to switch to other thread. So you flush everything you had in a, in a, in a cache. Some, uh, some other thread is taking everything from the cache. It takes time. And maybe before he is ready to send his data to the client, the scheduler comes, nasty guy. Sorry, your time is gone. Then back again, so we are wasting a lot of resources. So basically, if you want to know more, you can check this uh, uh, more or less Martin Thompson mechanical sympathy. There are a lot of uh, talks about it. Why? L1 caches are very important and how do they affect the processing. But what we need in order to do that is something called async IO. So it means I can call read the file, not that I read the file and wait for each byte to be read. I need something like asynchronous IO. I need asynchronous databases, which is for instance called the Demonte or Cassandra. And there is a problem with SQL there. There are asynchronous drivers for SQL databases, but I only know for two of them. And basically, they are, no, they are not um, compliant with JDBC, but it's a different story. But one thing, I've shown you that non-blocking with one thread, you can have a match, but it doesn't mean 
you get instant performance. So whenever you use like Graphpack server, you get a perfect performance. But what it means, what I see on production is, if you have something like not working server Graphpack, you can control, you can tune your performance very well. If you don't have it, uh, it's like you are really, um, you are exposed to random effects of red schedulers, whatever, it's very hard to control. Even if you know what's slow in your system, it's very hard to fix it. So with a rat pack and one working server, sometimes it's very easy to tune your performance. You see like maybe, oh, calls to database are in fact slowing me time, so I mean, maybe I will devote more threads to that. But only for that. But, but my goal is that performance is nice. But what I'm looking for my life as a software engineer, an architect is a clean code, is a better code. And I am very, very dissatisfied with the things that I find it in those frameworks that are very popular. I work with them like 15 years, so even first version of Java E, first version. <coughs> I, I haven't worked with Spring 1.0, I started with Spring 2. But, uh, and I loved those platforms years ago. But after I've seen the alternatives, I hate it right now, really. Because they really, they like, uh, rely totally on magic. What is magic? Runtime reflection, aspect, <coughs> <coughs> locals, class loader, spam, annotations, dependency condition, containers. What it means, I compile the code, my hundred of tests are working, and I put it on production and it doesn't work, because magic stopped working. Because everything that is important happens in runtime. Compiler doesn't know if, for instance, the transaction are started, because they are in annotations, okay? So that's a magic, so what I sometimes see is that well, every program in Java that relies on magic files sooner or later ends with no going to exception, so you can even skip that part and do it very quickly like this. Okay. Uh, but you know, there is a solution. So previously, like five years ago, I haven't seen other other <coughs> I was, you have to write it this way. We didn't, we didn't have lambdas. Since we have lambdas, a lot of things can be written differently. But the community, I've seen Java developers haven't seen that so far. So who, I really recommend new talks from Mario Fusco, GOF patterns. Oh, that's my other talk on annotations. So, oh, that's the page, annotation manual. Well, we concentrate, how can we, we write stuff we are, we are really writing for years with annotations with just plain Java and Lambda, okay? That's, uh, and might be that I will, I'm doing this talk on Thursday, okay? So we can see. And right now, I just quickly want you to present something else. So does it work on a bigger scale? OK, bigger scale depends what is bigger scale on you. So let's, let's see the whole project. Uh, sorry. So there is one kind of, oh, again, one kind of project I'm typically do. Why, why don't you work <laughs> what I want you to do? A uh, uh, moment. Enter, enter. Okay, I'm not going to present you something because, ah, I know, I'm here. So I'm starting something called Ratpong. So whenever you want to see, is it possible to write a bigger project in Java without annotation, without Spring, without Java E, a server part program, there is, there is this project called Ratpong. Ratpong, what is that? So Ratpong is my standard uh, proof of concept if a framework is worth to be looked at. I. Whenever I'm looking at a new web framework in Java, I'm doing this. It's Pong game, multiplayer, so for instance, I'm play, playing as player one. You know Pong? It's a very old game, like, okay? So maybe I even start as a second player. Uh, hopefully I'll, okay, I do, and I will, I will, ah, yes, <laughs> I did it, yeah, you see it? So I'm working, it's really, it's really a multiplayer internet game. It's an amazing multiplayer, okay? Always on one table there, they play two, two players. But it works. You have the whole code, there is a database behind the records, whatever. It's all written with Ratpack and in a modern way. By, by the way, the most fun part is, uh, okay, I will show you later, okay? So very quickly to the, to the, to the part, what, to the talk, what I wanted to, to tell you. So the code is there on my GitHub. And right, uh, right now, it's about Rappa. It's just a library and a tool. It's not a framework, you know, so like Java E or Spring are framework. This is only a tool, okay? It's net device, utilizes, utilizes Java 8, and best part, I love, it doesn't use magic. So you are free of magic. That's cool. So how do you present the uh, road? Like, for instance, with prefix games, when
whenever someone do, does a post, we call these methods like, oh, uh, please join game. Or in other cases, maybe we on get, we have list of games, or we create game with post. Okay, so you see, I can, like whenever we, I have HTTP routing, it's a uh, functional way of writing it. So you see this, uh, this on my, on my Radcon uh, example. So, but, okay, I skip that part. So just remember, Radcom is all about giving promises. So you don't render the result like split or whatever. You render mostly promise of something, like a future. Uh, it's very easy to do JSON. Uh, I perfectly like working with all table tables. So full part of it is that the Radcom implementation you see doesn't use, on, almost never uses mutable objects. Everything is like final values. Uh, only part that is mutable is, in fact, data. Okay, so all final variables and monads and everything. So if you want to know more, there's a great talk from Mario Fusco Monad in Java and it's explained. So configuration is composable. Testing of RATPAD is great, right? Like, you have uh, this test HTTP client and you can do perfect easy. Annotation. <coughs> what? <laughs> uh, so on my talk I tell why this annotation is okay, okay? There is a there is a talk where I say which annotations are cool, which are less cool, okay? This is for me cool annotation. Okay. Nevertheless, testing is easy, and remember, it starts like 15 milliseconds. So you can do that kind of hand, that kind of black of testing, like, you know, 50 per second. It's not slow at all. And it's really real testing. So if you think about security, you can do security with, like, without annotation, but with, like, uh, this high order functions. So I won't go to these details because I can other come to that, and today I don't have much time. But it's possible to do transactions, persistence of, all with parallel functions. For instance, transaction to JOQ, great project. I start that transaction here, and I put my code here. What I'm going to do in transaction? I'm going to insert something into database. And it's inside transaction. Instead of calling the transaction here, I just call the method. That's a transaction for me. Which means it is testable. It is, it is proven by compiler. It's cool. So, okay, about Blocking and non-blocking, uh, I don't have much time to explain you that. Just look, there is an explanation on what is GitHub project, RATCOM, and with the persistence. This is the biggest problem of RAT, uh, of RAT pack and whatever non-blocking uh, system you are using in Java, non-blocking server. Uh, SQL databases are blocking, JDBC is blocking. So it's very hard to do it. There, is our, there are ways, and I present them, uh, but the, the best idea for me is to use something, for instance, I'm promoting is DropDB. You do it something small and you just need the persistence, maybe you can forget about SQL databases or use no SQL. And web sockets are very easy with Radpack and maybe lessons for me. Coding for Radpack is awesome because it's finally in Java. I'm relying on compiler, not on magic. But it's very different to what I've been doing for years with Spring or Java E. So whoever starts this project first time with like rat pack, well, just you can the first project will be very, very tough. It's a completely different mindset. Uh, the bad and good part, you have a completion stage or it's called also promise, whatever, or future everywhere. So you have like monadic code. In Java, it's not that looking nice at all. It's a bad part, it looks better in Kotlin or in Scala. Uh, it's very easy to do JSON integration, it's very easy to do SIM testing. Uh, web sockets are very easy. I love this project, Bubble, that was previously called JavaSlam. It's very easy to integrate with Radpack. And JDBC is possible with some tags. I present them on this GitHub project. And I love writing code because it relies on immutability. Okay. Uh, so, what is not cool is this problem of completion stage in the name of future promises everywhere. Basically, all of them, all those containers are the same. They represent the same type of object, but because of historical reasons, I have uh, they are written on Radpack uses promises, Guava uses its enabled future, and Java 8 uses completion stage, and you have a lot, lot of time you have to convert between them, even though it's the same uh, the same object. Radpack uses a lot of throws exception in IPI, and a lot of examples are in Ruby, and writing with monads in Java uh, is just not cool. So that's a, that's a bad part. What are other uh, alternatives? Spring Web 5 Reactive, something published recently. It's basically, okay, I will come. FKS, TPP, and Plasma. So, Spring Web, Flux, I, I've seen different names. I basically say it's as a rat pack, but I think the API is way better. 
was just like, they did it. Uh, Rockpack, I would say, was written years ago on Ruby. So API in Java is not that great. It's very mature, it's very stable, but API, in my opinion, is not that cool. So Spring 5 API for uh, this kind of uh, stuff is much better. It's like right now in late September it was published. It really, I really like it. For me, it's like the biggest problem why it's even called Spring. Because if I'm doing Spring without, without annotation, without Spring beans, without uh, uh, in, um, how, um, how they call it, all these interceptor aspects, for me, the same as Ratback. So why to confuse it with Spring? It's a great name, but nevertheless, I'm doing like, whenever I write several this way, it's like I'm doing Spring without Spring. But it's cool, really. It's really well done. So in this example of Spring code, you really see, in my opinion, it's more readable than what you see in, in Ratback code. Okay? So FHTP is the same, but for like, like Ratback, but for Scala, it's other project, uh, also great. Lago, but remember Ratback or whatever is just HTTP part, okay? So it's only web server. Whenever you need a persistence, all that stuff, security, maybe you won't want to have the big like, pack of uh, frameworks, of tools. So Spring is one example, Java is and one alternative is Lago. That's just very shortly, it's something new on the market. It's not very popular, but it's cool. Uh, so like, I, I think like Java E and this classic Spring with annotations, everything, for me it's like answering to the problems of the in 90s. I started that time and those things were cool. They were very cool, even like 10 years ago they were cool even in 2010, but right now I think if we are going to have cleaner code, there are some better alternatives without magics, dreadlocks, whatever, but just think about functional code, immutability that's perfectly testable, use higher order functions, monads, that's cool. So whenever, okay, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, behind the schedule with the time, so if you have questions, I'm waiting there, just ask me, and because I think the next session is going to start. So thank you very much.